Well, thank you all for you joining us. <laughs> We're here to basically talk about the future of television, the future of entertainment, uh, what it's going to look like, what the platforms are. I'm Steve Clemens. I'm editor-at-large of The Atlantic, and it's a great pleasure to be with all of you this morning. Um, I've just been at another forum this morning in this same track where we had someone from ABC News, uh, someone from Reddit, uh, the editor-in-chief of Thomson Reuters, and uh, 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 one other, it was 15 minutes ago, but it was there. But basically talking about how um, media and news are going to be increasingly driven by the people in these seats. That, that those that are in the broadcast business have to figure out how you're going to navigate both platforms, content, driving your own content, engaging in social media, and if, and if the folks that I have on stage don't become part of that, that they are likely to uh, suffer the fate of dinosaurs, uh, I've been told. We were just talking to them. And on our panel today, we have three uh, very important media uh, uh, players in the, in the American media and, 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 and even beyond the US. We have Cesar Conde, of the president of Univision, John Skipper, who's president of ESPN, and Paula Kerger, who's president of PBS. And PBS is such a um, huge network. I, I have just become a Downton Abbey fanatic. <laughs> I used to call it Downtown Abbey. Yeah, well. I was at a dinner with Alan Greenspan and some others, and they were all talking about the episodes, and I'd never felt so culturally illiterate in my life, and um, went around for about a week saying, I need to watch Downtown Abbey. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then <laughs> we finally... We were spotted as a neophyte by just that fact. Yes, yes. And, uh, and we're there. But I, I guess what I would like to you know, sort of open with the three of you is to ask you, how each of you are basically reaching very, very different audiences. Um, I am not a, I occasionally turn on ESPN, but I'm a sumo fanatic, and you don't have much sumo on ESPN. Uh, Probably have to look elsewhere for that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you in, can't really fit it on I the I would love to kind of get the, beyond, beyond the question of content, which we can get into, how are you looking at the question that years ago, you had, you had, had big networks, and they, you know, I, I grew up on Air Force bases, we had one network, mm -hmm. but broadly in the United States, you essentially had three. You had the Ed Sullivan Show, the Lawrence Welk Show, you had uh, Monday Night Football, and America largely had a pretty homogenized cultural experience watching you know, what came through those pipes. And now we've had an incredible diversity of pipes. We've had PBS for a long time, but all three of you have, have just changed the game, and, both in content, but how do you look at the pipes? I mean, I'd like to find an understanding, you know, when we look at iPhone and I watch people you know, basically downloading or they're on their plane and their tablets, is this a concern for you, or are we just basically obsessing ourselves with, with about stuff that doesn't matter? Oh, I'm going to start with Caesar. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you. Good morning. Look, we are, uh, I think, in a fascinating time in, in the media industry. Uh, I think everyone would agree this is probably the fastest pace of change we have seen, certainly in the last uh, decade, if not uh, the last few years. You know, I would tell you, in our particular case at Univision, we have, uh, we have you know, an interesting dynamic. On the one hand, we, our main network is a traditional broadcast network, and um, most networks are having a little bit of uh, loss in audience right now, the traditional broadcast networks. We, on the other hand, in, uh, in Spanish language, are still actually growing, so that's a, that's a good But problem. you're growing because of demographic change, not because you're any better, better than ABC. On, we're growing because we have a demographic that is exploding, and there's few places where they can find content that they connect with directly on a, on a culturally uh, relevant manner. Now, in the same breath, I would tell you, um, we are a demographic, we are a community, Hispanics here in the US, that skew extraordinarily young. Mm. And so, um, to give you a little, a little bit of context, uh, over 75% of Hispanics are under the age of 40 versus the rest of the population, which is about 55%, are under the age of 40. And so, what that means is this is a demographic that, you know, way over index, indexes on the consumption of uh, digital and social media, mm -hmm. uh, consumes and buys handheld devices at a higher rate. And so for us, um, this <coughs> transition to digital is something that we have to be very, very uh, on top of. And we have to make that transition right away because our consumer, our viewer, is making that transition faster than, than the rest of the population. And how, what is it, I mean, put that in human language. What, 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 what does that mean when you basically have people with handhelds, tablets, how are you reaching with them? How are you interacting with an audience other than just being a one-way broadcaster? Sure. Look, I think one of the biggest changes that we've seen in the media industry has probably been where the, the power lies. And in the old days, the power lied with the content creators. You would program at a certain time of the day or the night, and the consumers had to watch it there if they wanted to watch your program. Increasingly, we're going to a place where the power is in the hand of the viewer. And they want to be able to choose 
where they see it, how they see it, and on what device they see it. And so that's uh, our approach right now is we want to be everywhere in any place uh, and on any device that our consumers want to, co want to consume. And uh, that has a number of implications, which you know, we'll talk a little bit about today on the panel. Um, but it, goes, uh, it touches on everything from how do we train our existing workforce to you know, change the DNA in their mind so that we can produce thinking of multi-platform multi world um, to how we deal with our partners and our advertisers, because that has implications there as well. John, how do you guys do it at ESPN? The, um, well, look, the, uh, first of all, we try not to say the word television that much. Uh, it's just video. And what there has been in the last few Should years. Should we just drop that word? I mean, we had that big I'm, I'm not sure I get, I get to like mandate that. This is like that, the future but. of TV. But you know, TV is that, or TV used well, to be a big well, box that. Well, certainly, that, yeah. uh, within my generation, you say television, it implies the great CBS, ABC, NBC, Troika, when everybody sat around and watched All in the Family together and everybody talked about it on Monday. That's clearly gone. And we don't spend a lot of time thinking about television. What we think about is video. And there's this enormous proliferation of video from many, many more content producers than there used to be. And that's a good thing. People have more and more and more choices. The second really important thing that's happened is that you don't have to watch it in your living room at 9 o'clock when somebody schedules it. You can watch it whenever you want to watch it, and you can watch it on whatever device you want to watch it. And the, the consumption of video on digital devices, smartphones, and and uh, tablets is profound. I mean, that really is shifting how things get consumed and what they do. Now, we live at ESPN within a, a specific uh, segment of all that video, which is sports. And there is a uniqueness to sports that makes what we do different than what everybody else does, which is you do actually have to watch it at 9 o'clock <laughs> when we schedule it, because that's when the game is. And 99.2% of our live events are watched live. So what's much more important for us is that you have the ability to watch it wherever you are on whatever device. So tablets and smartphones are actually enormously helpful for us. In the 2010 World Cup, uh, where most of the games, in the World Cup in South Africa, uh, where most of the games were played at 7 in the morning, 9.30 in the morning, one out of every three people who watched a game watched on a device other than that screen in their home. Uh, they watched on the computer in their office, they watched on a smartphone, and that, so when you have this discussion about, wow, this thing is coming, it's already here. That was one out of three. How and many channels do you run on now? We, we have uh, eight channels. Eight channels, mm -hmm. and do you run any of your coverage not over those sort of networks, but over the internet only? No. Uh, we have lo lots of things mm -hmm. uh, on the internet, but we have another philosophy that's very important to us, which is we have a number of channels, ESPN, ESPN2, News, You, Deportes, um, I'll get to that. I have somebody who works for me in the furnace yeah. to make sure. He said, you got to remember sure this. Getting it. Right. Um, are you, are you going to be in those, trouble? Those are our 24-7 yeah. linear networks. And what they are is distributed everywhere. Right. Uh, and on the other hand, what you do have to do, now we're in like 19 different issues, is you have to have a pay television subscription. We can get to that in order to get those channels, and then you can watch them anywhere. And, we do and have, you can go back and watch things that already happened? Uh, if you DVR them, you can. Yeah, you can't. It see. just doesn't happen I in see. sports. There's very little reason to do it. Now, Marie Donahue, who I work with here, held up three fingers. ESPN3 <laughs> is actually a internet channel, which ah. means that it's not a 24-7 well, linear channel. That was my channel. question. Yeah, was, was there something that didn't run over TV that would run? Because that's what C-SPAN, I mean, not well, to get again, out of it. Well, again, it depends on what you call right. it. We, we don't call it TV. It is a screen. Huh. It's video. It's just is different. All, all we can deliver on a 24-7 linear channel is one stream. Clearly here we can deliver, we have delivered as many as 82 games at one time. So you can show a whole bunch of games. You go on and look at a menu and choose which one you want to watch. And that experience will not be very different from a 24-7 linear experience as soon as you're watching on an internet. So you're self-selecting and you can basically stream through and pick whatever comes over your line or your pipe. Oh, whatever appears yeah. on your screen. As long as you pay your five ninety five or whatever it is for it. No, this is, uh, you, this is we, we distribute this channel through traditional uh, telco, satellite, and cable distributors, but you have to watch it over your broadband connection. But of course, that's going to be indistinguishable. I mean, when you get an Apple television, you, you don't know if you're watching through a cable or you're watching over your wireless connection in your house 
or whether you're watching through your internet connection. You're just watching a screen with so video on it. Before I move to Paula, can I ask, how do you deal with the kind of rights element? I, 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 I was fascinated the other day. I missed the Tonys. How many of you saw the Tonys? Did any of you see Neil Patrick Harris in that opening number? Wasn't it great? I, only, I was only able to hear how great it was because I still haven't been able to see it. Because CBS took it all of, off the YouTube sites, even took it off its own site. I don't know if they're saving it for kind of like, you know, go so, to the movies and pay, you know, 11 bucks to see Neil Patrick Harris open the Tonys again. <laughs> but, but it raised the interesting question that you've got stuff out there, content. You know, if you're at the Atlantic, we want, or you have a Ron Brownstein article, we want everybody in the world, I want it to run at HuffPost, I want it to run it, you know, on ESPN, I want the Brownstein article to appear everywhere. But increasingly, you're seeing a tension between trying to grab and contain content and then, and then perhaps charge at the gate, well, well, and those that, I mean, what you're already doing on the front end. The, but how, how do you deal with that, that well, in the... In well, that's the, ridiculous. I do think that actually important. is ridiculous, of course. I don't know why they're doing that, but... Uh, they, they are, are doing They it. may be the very definition of a traditional TV network, of uh -huh. course. And if it's... I, I did see it on YouTube. Maybe they pulled it down. Well, they I, pulled it down. Yeah. I, I, that's incomprehensible to me, why, why you would do that. Is anybody <laughs> from CBS here can answer that? No. Um, we'll come back. We'll give them a chance to respond like uh -huh. any good journalist should. Uh, Paula, you, at, at, at PBS... It may be rights issues, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, I but, but in your own rights issues, and bo both of yours, are, are you, at, at Univision, are you someone that promotes the kind of lateral grabbing of your content so that people can use it, slice it up, move it across platforms? Or do you try to kind of contain, you know, enclose your market, so to speak? No, the short answer is we believe we want our, our content to live in as, as many places as possible, obviously within the parameters of what we call windowing, make sure that you know it's living in the right places. It's got a little during, Univision brand on it during during yeah. the amount of time and in the and in the way that we would like it to live. You know, I'll make a small comment on something like YouTube. You know, for us, we look at that as a potential threat, but a potential opportunity threat in the sense of you know there's you know a tremendous amount of content that that's growing there and, and can be attractive. At the same time, um, we as um, as content creators also can be very smart and use that as a promotional tool. So, so if you had an interview and you interviewed President Obama and everyone needed to see that interview because it really looked, or the, on the immigration debate, for instance, are you going to let that run or are you going to force everybody through a portal? Well, I think one way of thinking about it is yeah. maybe you show the five-minute clip mm -hmm. on, on YouTube or something like that as a promotional vehicle, and then if you want to watch the full 20-minute or 30-minute, you can come to a Univision, U Videos, which is our, our uh, TV Everywhere play, to watch the full piece. So there's different ways of cutting it. Now, Paula, you, you are, are one of the kind of keepers of the flame of public interest, journalism, you know, we were talking last night about Frontline, which is, um, I don't know if, how many of you are, you know, fans of PBS NewsHour or watch the various Masterpiece Theater shows or kind of look at the broad public broadcasting. These don't exactly lend themselves to the same at-the-gate revenue or subscription revenue, I think, though Paula may share with this, but when I look at Frontline, Frontline's got to be one of the bravest shows. When you look at the line of shows that they do, and I look at the underwriters that I know or companies I know, I know that there's just, they're all interested, but too toxic, too right? Toxic. Everything yeah. you do too in Frontline to is too toxic, deeply researched. And I'm just wondering how you keep this show alive in a world today that's so driven by what you can get underwritten. Well, uh, for us, as we look at the investments that we make in content, there are projects that we do that clearly have the good potential for corporate underwriting or foundation sponsorship. Frontline is a series that has received some foundation support and some individual philanthropy, but we largely fund it. So when we say thank you to viewers like you, that is in part where some of your resources are going into series like Frontline. Part of the, of the success of Frontline is an extraordinary team uh, that drills down and is relentless in the covering. Part of their success now, I think, is, and it's coincidence that we're all on the panel together because um, what Frontline has done very successfully, in addition to being very aggressive in looking at digital platforms as a way of putting content everywhere, is partnerships. And we've actually partnered with both yeah. of your organizations just this week. We did a very important documentary called Rape in the Fields, which is about the challenges of immigrant women who are assaulted and cannot report because of fear of deportation. That program ran on um, this week on Frontline. It airs, I think, tomorrow night on Univision in Spanish. Mm. Um, later this fall, uh, we are doing an extraordinary two-part series in conjunction with your amazing documentary unit at ESPN on the issues around uh, concussion and in the NFL. 
And the uh, team at ESPN has done really extraordinary research over a number of years on this issue. And we're really proud to partner with them in taking some of their journalism and working together to create something that hopefully will have great reach. So I think that as we uh, think about our plans for the future, we think about a number of things. One is we are absolutely committed to putting our content everywhere in as many places as possible. We're also thinking very carefully about the content that we're creating, looking for market gaps, which seems ironic in an environment where you've got hundreds of media options, that there are still big gaping holes. And I would argue that investigative journalism is at the top of that list. But really looking at those areas where uh, we can add something significant. Where I think we have done the best job in really thinking about the future and thinking about a fully um, uh, realized um, world of multi-platform is in the kids space. Hmm. Um, over the course of the last, oh, I don't know, seven years, we've completely reworked our kids schedule. We always had really strong fine children's programming, uh, but for a long time we were alone in the space. You know, Sesame Street really defined <laughs> using television as an educational tool, um, but you know, slowly as, as commercial uh, some commercial organizations realized that this was an opportunity to create kids' content, that there was actually a market here. Um, we weren't alone. And uh, you know, from my perspective, for us to uh, do our work, we need to make sure that we're not duplicating what everyone else is doing. So we took a very hard look at our kids' schedule. We um, realized that what was missing um, is uh, curriculum-based content to help kids prepare for school. Most people don't realize that our kids' programming is built for um, kids who may live in homes without books or computers, but certainly have televisions. And we figure if we can reach those kids and give them basic skills to help them be successful in school, we can reach all kids. And so um, what we started was not only look at the content So you're developing a little bit of your own core curriculum for yeah, children. we actually are taking core curriculum that's been developed by early childhood experts and then incorporating that into the programming. So the programming isn't just fun and safe, but it also is truly educational. Is it one way, or are you finding in the platforms you have? I'm that going you can, there. Okay. I'm going there. So what we um, decided as we were building this work out, as we were seeing the beginning potential of multi-platform, um, and actually, we started very early with smartphones because we realized that for many families, a smartphone would be their computer. That we started to experiment with using those platforms as a way to really extend educational content and create interactive work. We do not talk to a children's producer now about a new show unless they come to us with a fully realized multi-platform uh, project. And um, we have uh, been, I think, enormously successful not only in creating great important content that helps kids succeed. But for 17 months running, we have been the number one destination for kids online. And we have five of the top 10 children's shows on television. So the two pieces, which is where I'm going with this long mm. ramble, the two pieces actually, um, I think, support each other. I think kids are watching television, and they're playing games, and they're not doing one at the expense of the other. I think the two sort of dovetail really nicely together. And where the kids are um, spending more and more time is actually not sitting at their laptops or their parents' laptops. They're going on mobile devices. And mm -hmm. we've seen in the last year, the traffic has tipped from being more um, directed or, or sourced from um, computers to now coming from smartphones and tablets. You know, I, I, it's not a competition, but I'm interested in the degree to which you know the footprint, the millions of, the number of millions of people your PBS platforms hit. In, in, in all its forms. Do you know that number? The number of uh, 30 million units 30 million. a month. And, and ESPN? How many people we like reach? Like how many, what's your, what's your? Uh, in the month of February, we reached 157 million people. 150, and Univision? Domestically, we do about 20 to 25 million. And each. globally? Uh, probably more uh, north of 40, 45. So, I mean, you're, you're both, hu all of your huge networks. Um, and as you see these, these you know, content questions, which mm -hmm. all of you have gone to, and I, I did not know that ESPN had a documentary division, but I have been on mm -hmm. ESPN where I have saw really high quality news coverage uh -huh. as opposed to uh -huh. sports. So it's uh -huh. become, you're basically taking your people uh -huh. and holding these sporting events up here, but also spoon feeding them some sort of smart journalistic mm -hmm. commentary as well. Do you, do, why are you doing that? Well, ESPN has a 
long tradition, long before I got there, Mr. Walsh is sitting here in the audience with us who's uh, one of the uh, progenitors of that uh, coverage. ESPN has a long tradition. We have a daily show outside the line that does uh, investigating and in, in enterprise journalism. We have a magazine mm -hmm. uh, that does that. We have a long form journalism site called grantland.com that is dedicated to sort of more of the sports cultural uh, landscape. Uh, we have E60, which is 60 is meant to be an homage to uh, 60 Minutes. So I'll give CBS some love after giving them some trouble, uh, which is a, a uh, feature uh, news show. And we do over 700, and on Sports Center, we do over 700 long form feature uh, stories a year, some of which are inspiring, some of which are enterprise, some of which are investigative. You, um, you heard Paula talk about our uh, joint uh, efforts here to do, to do um, to do uh, an investigation into concussions in the NFL, mm -hmm. and we're doing 30 to 35 uh, documentaries a year, uh, which uh, really are quite extraordinary. Some of them, most of them, under the brand name 30 for 30. So uh, clearly what we use to bring uh, viewers to our network are live events. However, we uh, once we get them there, we're very interested in having long form uh, investigative enterprise journalism on sports. There really is no other real outlet for that at this point. I mean, one of the issues you've got with the new landscape is the demise of newspapers, mm -hmm. including the demise, and we have the great Shelby Coffey sitting here with us, who I don't think will quarrel. Who's really, with, really, really great. <laughs> who I don't think will quarrel with, you know, you really have a problem right now. I mean, the sports pages which used to be fabulous. For those of you who don't know, Shelby Coffey is executive vice president of the museum, which is not only about modern news and everything, but it also captures mm -hmm. the leg. It's kind of like a museum, right, mm -hmm. of what used to be. And, and I, I don't know if you ever get shivers when you walk through the exhibits, but when you look at how it used to be and you realize how dramatically things have changed. We've got the Hewlett Packard New Media Gallery. Okay, great. And lots of ESPN. Excellent. Sports but, but my point was, of course, you, you these uh, daily newspapers around the country no longer right. really have the resources. We do, I mean, we're, we're not the public trust that PBS is, but we ultimately do believe we have a responsibility to do a certain amount of programming that is a bit of a public trust. So and let me flip that back at the three of you. Do you worry that you're the newspapers of tomorrow in the sense that when you look at what's happening with Hulu, you know, Jeff Bezos and his brother are very involved in Aspen, and Amazon, Netflix, Hulu, um, are self-initiating, and I kind of, what I find interesting about this panel is each of you are the dominant market players. We won't call them monopolies, but you basically have a sports monopoly. You basically have the Spanish language monopoly. Like this, you the have record. the public trust <laughs> record. monopoly. The record, we like this, uh, yeah. we have a, a preeminent yeah. position. Preeminent position. So we will lead The preeminent positions you three enjoy. But it, you know, uh, if, the if the Atlantic and National Journal, <laughs> if the Atlantic and National Journal were to say, because we are kind of in the PBS uh -huh. sort of space, you know, we're basically be able to self, and we're not anywhere near the scale or size, but you are seeing uh, very new entrants come in very fast, become very large, and say, hmm, you know, they may have some kind of binding contracts with, with, with some of these sports groups, but there's no reason, there's no, the, the barrier to access is low relatively low, I think, for some of these uh, players. And so I'm wondering, do you worry, I mean, you're responsible for being prescient. You have to look a little bit over the horizon of what's coming next. And do you see a, a, a big swarm of competitors basically eating away at your preeminent positions? Well, look, I'll, I'll take it from the Univision perspective. I'll touch on a few points. Um, you know, first is, you know, clearly there's more competitors in the space. Um, I can give you just from the Hispanic perspective, uh, 10 years ago, we had about eight or 10 uh, broadcast or cable networks focused on the Hispanic space. Uh, fast forward 10 years later, we have over 120, 120 uh, broadcast or cable networks focused on this demographic. Um, so clearly more people are coming in. At the same time, I think, um, as you alluded to, you know, the, the, the three companies that are represented up here have built over time tremendous brand recognition and loyalty with their, with their respective audiences. You know, from the Univision perspective, I, I think one of the things um, that we take very seriously is this uh, comment you alluded to, which is the responsibility that we have to our audience to bring them high quality programming, specifically journalism mm -hmm. in, in this day and age, um, particularly with the, with, with the difficulties that the print business is having. You know, we launched uh, two years ago um, our first ever documentary unit as well, which is we're so proud to be working with PBS on. Um, we also uh, launched our first ever uh, investigative unit um, as well to start looking at some of 
the unique uh, challenges and topics that our community has. And so the type of long form programming that we're doing, again, is something that we focus on to produce for Univision that can't be found anywhere else. So what's an example of that? One of the biggest challenges, obviously, our community is having um, here in the United States is education and education reform. We've gone out and we'll be bringing it uh, late, uh, I'm sorry, beginning of next year, um, an, uh, a documentary on the unique challenges that this uh, uh, community is having when it comes to education success. Now, I would argue that that's clearly an important issue for Hispanics, but when you look at the demographic trends we have in this country, that's actually an important issue for all Americans to hear about. And so the second piece of our strategy has been to continuously innovate. And we have this wonderful um, new partnership with, with Disney and, and John's uh, partners over at ABC News. Uh, we announced earlier uh, this year, and we'll be launching in November of this year, it's our first ever English language network. It's a joint venture between Disney and ABC News. It's called Fusion. And the concept there is how do we bring culturally relevant content to a demographic, the younger generations of Hispanics that may have been born here and may prefer to consume in English. And so that's been extraordinarily exciting. We have great partners in ABC News. And so not only are we able now to expand the conversation. Uh, when you to talk with ABC, do you get a sense that, they, that they're tied to old ways of doing things? Thomson Reuters just did this a very interesting survey. They look at how people consume news, interact with news, broadcast their own news. And when you get into it, and you look, if I were ABC News, I would just be really worried about my survival because they're not really that set up to be so engaged with their audience. So when, you, when you're dealing with these folks, do they have a sense of their own potential demise? Well, um, the, sh <laughs> the, short, the short answer is no. Um, I, I will tell you, you know, our, our head of news is in the audience here. His name is uh, Isaac Lee. He's our president of news. And he's been you know, a real pioneer in building this partnership with ABC News. And many of our ABC News friends uh, are, are in the audience. Uh, and I see Susan, I just had Susan, somebody from ABC News Susan on my Merkandetti last panel. Over there. So, uh, and what, what I can yeah. tell you, um, and this is why we were so excited to, to partner with them, I think they really understood what is the new American reality that we're living in. Do you see dynamism there? You ab see? Ab absolutely. And I think the, bringing the two companies together has allowed us to uh, complement each other from our strength John, and weaknesses. John, do you agree with anything he well, just ben said? Well, Ben Sherwin's a colleague yeah. of mine, so I got to yeah. defend my colleague Ben, of course. Yeah. I mean, they've done a number of things. They actually did a, um, a, a deal with Yahoo. Uh, and are now the largest news right. provider on the internet. Which I use all the time. Uh, ben has revitalized Good Morning America. I mean, I think they understand the challenges. But before we walked on stage, you said, I really wouldn't want to be the head of one of those three big networks. What, well, what I said yeah. is we don't have anybody up here represented. I didn't say yeah, I wouldn't okay. want to be the head of one of those <laughs> networks. I said we don't have the guys at CBS, ABC, and NBC, and Fox, for that matter, represented right. up here. Yeah. And the threat is greatest, of course, to the traditional networks. Uh, I don't think the threat, by the way, is digital or consumption on other devices. These guys are adapting to that. They're figuring that out. Mm -hmm. The threat is to the traditional business model. I, see. I mean, the threat is to the, you know, you used to reach such a large proportion of the U.S. population. You could charge a lot for advertising. The, the right. issue here is one revenue stream. Uh, they're trying to solve that with retransmission consent. So yeah, they're aware. These are smart people, and we're making progress. Fusion. I'll, I'll is give an you. Example I'll of give you one great adapt. example of Fusion, which I think is really is really interesting. Is this is a network that, out of uh, from its inception, it was always thought to be launched at the same time, both from a digital perspective as well as from a linear perspective. So, the way that Univision News and ABC News are thinking of this product, they are first starting with how is this millennial target, because that's who we're going after. Mm -hmm. How do they consume news? And they consume news, they define news in a very different way. No longer are they uh, going to television to find out you know, what's going on in the world. They're receiving that already on Twitter or through their social, social media uh, networks. They know that there was a bombing in Boston. They know that happened this morning. Why are they going to, to television? Um, why are they going to watch video? And thinking of building a product starting with digital mentality in mind, I think is going to be the innovation uh, secret sauce that we're doing at Fusion. And we're very proud of where, where we're at so far. Paul, this PBS, I mean, you were t describing what was going on with uh, the children's programming and the interactive platforms and content there. Mm -hmm. But as you look at the, re I mean, I love PBS. And I think like many people probably, if you ask me, you look at it as something to really be treasured, saved. But you know, you're also going to have to compete, make your way. I mean, are you finding you're able to get the, the resources you need to compete with say these guys and what they're able to do with digital innovation and platforms, are you able to do the same kinds of things 
with, with you know, PBS NewsHour, uh, for instance? Well, you know, look, um, one of the truisms of PBS is that we've never been well-funded, and uh, we've always um, really worked hard to, you know, cobble together the funding. We get 15, 1.5% of our funding for the federal government, which we are constantly fighting to preserve. Um, because that money actually goes to our stations. It doesn't actually come to us. And um, for some of the stations in the country where the, that number is an aggregate number. So um, there are some stations that half of their revenue comes from the federal government, like in rural parts of the country, where one would argue public broadcasting plays a very important role. And uh, so um, we combine that, obviously, with um, corporate support, foundation support, and largest support is individual philanthropy. Uh, because we, um, our funding comes from multiple sources, in some respects, uh, and, and it's interesting as there have been lots of discussions about the future of journalism, and a lot of discussions come back to building something which is actually the public broadcasting model. Um, but I, I think that the reality is that you know, um, resources are hard to come by. And so we are constantly looking at ways to be more efficient in the way that we're producing uh, in the digital space. Uh, the cost structure is different. So the, you know, the revenue side is complicated, which obviously we, like everyone else, are trying to figure out. But uh, because um, we're not advertiser-driven, I think it has given us the opportunity to be a bit more experimental and to take more risk in that space. Mm -hmm. And so we have um, carved out some resources to not only think about projects <laughs> that we have created for broadcast and what they might look like in an online environment, and looking at distribution through tablets and, and so forth. Ironically, some of the companies that you just talked about, Netflix and Hulu and Amazon, have, have been actually places we've distributed content which have given us some resources to help mm. us as we build other places. But what we've tried to do also is to look at um, you know, sort of up and coming filmmakers that are coming out of YouTube and other places and really trying to leverage that in the digital space. So we've looked at it as a, as a place for great experimentation. It's been an opportunity so you're for us. you're crowdsourcing your talent and content. And it's also been a way for us to bring in you know, new people and new voices, which for, at the end of the day, it's all about the content. And if you really Do you have like old PBS well, hands who've been there for 30 <coughs> years say you can't believe you're doing that? Well, it's a process, yeah. you know, and uh, I mean, I just wonder if there's some sort of crusty curmudgeon. Yeah, saying well, we're, we're you know, change is hard even under the yeah. best of circumstances. And, you know, obviously there are people that think that we can go back to 20 years ago and, you know, that's not going to happen. So I think, I think more and more people recognize that we've got to be willing to try some new and different things. And, and actually, on the technology side, we've always been innovators. We created closed captioning. Um, it was done out of WGBH. We've created, uh, the, we were the first to really um, use satellite interconnection. We're the, you know, we were early on with uh, high definition and multicast. So we've always really tried to, we've got really wonderfully talented engineers that are always trying to figure out what do you do with the technology? So listen, I want to bring the audience in here, and I want to give the first question to someone from ABC. And I want to say, for the record, <laughs> I love ABC, but my job is to provoke. And, to, uh, and I did have Rena Ninen uh, from ABC News on our last panel, but I, I just wanted to kind of create a little fun tension. Anybody from ABC want to raise a hand and ask a question? No one here. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Right over here, this gentleman, uh, the red shirt, if we can run a mic back to him. Uh, my name is Michael Conniff. Mr. Skipper, I mainly want to thank you. I want to thank you for um, Sir Ian Dark and Macker for bringing English Premier League uh, soccer to America. Um, here, here. And I wish you still had it <laughs> going forward. Also want to thank you for 30 by 30, the documentary series, which is amazing. And mainly want to thank you for Bill Simmons and Grantland. Um, and my question is, do you have any, Bill Simmons is really, to me, the emergence of the fan as celebrity. Uh -huh. um, do you have any other plans to, moving forward, to leverage this, this strange concept of the fan? Great comment, great question. Well, what I think what Bill Simmons allows us to do is to change the model a little bit, and Bill is a little bit like new journalism was, right, in the 60s and 70s. He injects himself into the middle, does not, uh, does not pretend to be uh, neutral, and nevertheless provides you real insight into the game, insight into the play, while 
making it feel like he's just like you, right? He's just a fan. Now, Bill Simmons is not just like a fan. There's nobody who understands more about the NBA. Read Bill Simmons' book of basketball uh, if you want to get dizzy uh, with a comparison between, you know, whether Bill Russell or Walt Cham Wilt Chamberlain had better teammates <laughs> or not. Um, Bill's a bit of a unique entity. So, I mean, what we've really tried to do is to use Bill to be Bill. But you see him on our NBA show. You see that we did fund and start Grantland, which is Bill manages for us uh, or edits for us uh, and is basically committed to long-form journalism on sports and the milieu around sports, music and culture and, and uh, film, et cetera, et cetera. But he's a bit of a unique beast. I mean, most of what we do is still fairly traditional. Right? It's still fairly traditional sports journalism, and I think you'll see us sort of continue to do that. While I was interested in sort of the answer about, or your question about the sort of the curmudgeons about 30 years ago, I mean, there is no reason not to continue to do well-researched, well-written, copy-edited, uh, fact-checked journalism. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to adapt to a world where there are people are commenting and where people think they are journalists because they have a Twitter account. And we have to be able to do that. We figure out ways to use it. We figure out ways to participate. But I don't think it's a substitute. And we are fortunate because we have the resources and can continue to do this. Uh, the question there really is the will of a management. And we have the will in what is essentially a, I mean, we're part, a division of a large public company whose job is to return share return value to shareholders. I, I think the point embedded in your question as well is equally relevant to PBS, Univision, and other networks uh, or any organization uh, engaged in, in, in public broadcast today because you find today, like Paula was talking about, people out there in say entertainment or commentary through YouTube, or in my case, I was out of the think tank industry and blogging, and you see people build up their own franchises. They're, they weren't you know, out and necessarily found by someone, but they build a franchise, and then that right. in the hybridization, which I think is happening in all of your networks uh, and news organization, you're finding people able to self-initiate, which I find so fascinating, is in the old days, that was not the case. It was very, very hard mm -hmm. to become a Johnny Carson or an Ed Sullivan or to break through at that level. Uh, other questions? Comments right up here in the front, and we'll then we'll go to this gentleman here. I don't know who, who I'm uh, running around the room, and I apologize. There we go. Mm -hmm. What's your name? What is your name? Oh, Lolly. Lolly, thank you. With the transformation of content, what do you believe the revenue model of the future is, and do you believe the gamification of content will, will be part of that? And what's, and I'm sorry, the what of content? The gamification of content. So you have content, you have questions that pop up, and you answer, and mm -hmm. you've seen some of that in the revenue model. What do you think the future is? So revenue model. Uh, look, we, we, uh, we think the revenue model for the foreseeable future is the one we still enjoy, which is a dual revenue stream where distributors of large packages of video pay us a subscriber fee per month. <clears throat> we aggregate an audience uh, on the, through those distributors, and we sell advertising. Uh, and for us, it's about two-thirds, one-third. Uh, there really is no nothing... Uh, I think you used the word prescient, that we're, we're charged with being prescient. There is no substitute for that in the foreseeable future. Hmm. Uh, right here, this gentleman here. Are you the one from Oklahoma City? I am. Great. <clears throat> I'm Good. Bob yes. Ross from Oklahoma City. I run two uh, private foundations. One is a journalism foundation, so I've been in your session the past uh, two, two sessions. My question um, is on investigative journalism. And uh, we started a, a nonprofit investigative journalism organization called Oklahoma Watch in Oklahoma. But wanted to, uh, to uh, talk or, or hear you all talk a little bit about investigative journalism and how you, um, how you work with the, the local or state organizations that are really filling this, this gap uh, at PBS. Let me, let me jump to Caesar on that and then Paula. Okay. Caesar? Sure. Look, and, and, and uh, from our perspective, um, I mean, it is core, core to what we do. As I alluded to before, we launched our investigative uh, unit, investigative division, uh, a couple of years ago. And again, where we add value is really focusing on the topics that are unique to our community or we have a unique perspective of, uh, and insight. And so obviously here in the United States, um, that's everything from issues like education to uh, immigration reform uh, and, and the like. I will tell you internationally, though, uh, we have also tried to uh, bring in stories that would be relevant for uh, the, greater, the greater viewing audience, but that we have a unique perspective. Uh, for example, uh, earlier this year, 
our investigative team did a wonderful piece about the influence uh, of our increasing influence of Iran in, in Latin America and in some specific countries. And so this occurred during the national debate that we were having about our strategy uh, and dynamics in Iran. And so I think that was one way where we were able to contribute to the larger discussion. Paula? And I would add the uh, project that I was talking about that was a partnership with Univision was also um, the other partners in that were the Center for Investigative Reporting and the Investigative Reporting Unit out of UC Berkeley um, with Lowell Bergman. So I think that as we um, uh, look at the work that we're doing in this space, uh, it, again, our, our lead franchise in investigative reporting is Frontline. Uh, they work with ProPublica. They've worked with print organizations like McClatchy, and uh, um, actually they did a, a great series of reporting um, with Times Picayune and other print uh, organizations. Uh, but they also are working with our stations that are in communities around the country. Uh, for many communities, the last remaining locally owned and operated broadcasters are the public stations, public television, public radio. And uh, some of those stations have come together and informed their own uh, journalism units with some support with the Corporation for Public Broadcasting that are covering specific issues. And so uh, we're always looking for uh, relationships and partners with those kinds of organizations because if you can put a uh, larger group of, of reporters who are on the ground covering an issue um, around a project, then it just the richness of it. Uh, we did a, a piece, uh, I think it was last year, on the, um, uh, the, the front line did with, um, on, that looked at the coroner system in this country. And they did uh, that in partnership with both ProPublica and NPR. And the output of that was not only a really strong uh, documentary piece, but it also resulted in a week long of reporting on uh, Morning Edition. So I think that the opportunity, uh, which I think in part both the technology and frankly the economics of our time, are really forcing uh, all of us to think a little differently about what it means to do a project. Now I will say partnerships are extraordinarily difficult and it is always much easier to do it yourself if you call all the shots. But I think that what has made uh, the work coming out of Frontline so significant is that they have looked at how to build those kind of relationships and partnerships, recognizing that everyone is going to give a little bit up in order to come together. But um, to share in the output uh, has, I think, resulted in really strong award-winning journalism. All, all three of you are involved in cutting-edge journalism. John, as I think about ESPN, the sort of doping and steroid scandals, you've got, uh, in, in, the, in the case that you're covering, kind of the broad case, that, that in all of these areas it raises a, and I keep um, referring to my friend Ron Brownstein here, but a kind of Ron Brownstein-style question is, in your, have you noticed whether the price you pay for high-quality coverage of the government has changed at all? That we, we're now, in, in the Washington arena, looking at the fact that uh, colleagues' phone records at AP or Fox or others are being subpoenaed and looked at, and it's raised this interesting question about the tension between the sort of investigative journalism. This question, this gentleman's, you know, question was, I think, earnest, saying, "How do you deal with these, you know, state and government agencies?" You know, I, my view is government pretends to be transparent and almost never really is. And, and in that, are you finding that the relationship between what you're reporting about, particularly these kind of taboo and cutting edge subjects where government is involved, whether the relationships changed at all? Look, our, uh, ours is very seldom involved with the government. Uh, our most interesting issue around investigative journalism has to do with the fact that our investigative journalism is almost exclusively targeted at large sports entities mm -hmm. with whom we are also in business. So managing that conflict and trying to keep separate that we are doing stories on concussions while we are uh, broadcasting NFL football games and giving injury Do you reports. ever get calls from those uh, network, those, those league heads and um, say you're it, never going to work in this close, town again? It, yeah, it's close to yeah. a daily phenomenon, but I never, get the, <laughs> I never get the last part of this. Right. But we always, we get the calls. Uh, and we sometimes have people within those organizations who have sometimes have a hard time understanding how can you be partners and doing this. Uh, our point of view, of course, this is ultimately good for the ecosystem of sports. You need uh, people to be holding people, you know, be uh, making sure people are doing the right thing. And most of the people who run the major leagues 
are looking to have the same thing. So we don't, no, we never get any threats. We get the calls, they want us to be fair, they want to make sure we hear their point of view, which we do, but we manage that conflict, we think, very well. Caesar, how do you wrestle with government? Yeah, no, no, I think the same way, uh, you know, as John alluded to, you know, there's always a natural tension. I mean, we as journalists have to, have to do our job. I think in our particular case, I'll give you a, a, an anecdote or an example. Um, you know, the issue of, of immigration reform in this country over the last, um, clearly everyone's talking about it today and post-election, but before that, um, it was a little bit of a, a tense subject. And you know, our particular role from a journalistic perspective is to make sure that we're asking the tough questions that our audience wants to know about and find out perspectives from all sides. And so you know, sometimes you get a little bit of the feedback of, you know, hey, you all are obsessed on this topic and therefore you're trying to sort of move the needle one way or the other. We're not. Um, what we're trying to do is make sure um, that we hold our elected officials accountable on the specific positions that they may have on a topic that matters uniquely to, to our community. But that's just, I think, a little bit of the natural tension you'll always have. I, I want to answer it a slightly different way. Um, I think that as I look at uh, reporting and, and government, I'm more concerned about state and local reporting. Mm. Um, because I think that in, if you look at, at where there are now holes in our coverage, it's really, um, I think, most acute at the international level and with local. And, you know, so you have a lot that can go wrong uh, with no one watching. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think as we look at the work that we're doing moving forward, I think that both on the side of, specifically on the side of public radio, so I'll, I'll talk about my colleagues there, who've done a really uh, extraordinary job at really trying to keep journalism robust at the local level. And I, we're encouraging our uh, television stations, some of which actually are part of the same organizations locally, so it's a little easier there, to really work with our public radio partners to make sure that you know, those stories are being covered. When you look at the fate of newspapers like The Plain Dealer, I mean, that should make, mm -hmm. give all of us a little bit of pause. Who's going to step into that space? And I am really interested in the work that citizen journalists do. I think they play an important role, but it does not, it's complementary, but it does not replace good old fashioned journalism with fact checking and the kind of skills that are important for us to understand the issues of the day. Well, and maybe to hold one of the big ideas, I don't want to take responsibility, but you know, when I listen to Yo Yo Ma and Davian Wetzel here talk about citizen artistry and citizen artists, maybe there's a role to inculcate citizen journalists with some of these uh, habits of, of interaction with new media that, that, that we haven't thought through because we have yeah. delegated to all of you that responsibility. Yeah. I Maybe mean, that's... I, I do think there's a role, and I, I know that um, there are some that, that don't see it, but I think you've, you've got the power of people that are, that are watching and observing, and I think if we could figure out how to, how to best integrate that with some of the work we're doing, I think so it'd be Steve, hugely powerful. I mean, before you, I mean, when you say citizen journalist, what does that mean exactly? That means uh, what I see is someone, uh, I mean, it, I think it means different things to different people. We should ask the audience what they think. But I think this gentleman here who is in the last session uh, has 700 and some odd followers on Twitter. He's engaged in early education. He wants to write about it and grow his voice on the internet, mm -hmm. write responsibly about these issues. And I think he would represent for me a responsible uh -huh. yeah. person who wants to enter the field of commentary, right. interaction, right. become his own network. So. I'm, you know, I, am I largely right? So, but, but just to be provocative, yeah. are you a trained journalist? No. Right. So, I mean, you're a citizen writer and, and a blogger, but I mean, it's an interesting potential oxymoron that, that it, and it cheapens the term journalist, the idea that anybody who decides to write well, I on think the, right? In our last session, one of the questions from a Thomson Reuters guy was, what does journalism mean today? Right. And my response to that is it's in flux. Yeah. The real right. answer to it, and that's part of what's going on. What is new? What is media? What are the networks today? It's in flux. If yeah. Netflix, which used to distribute DVDs, mm -hmm. is now distributing House of Cards, and I'm addicted to it, um, you know, Kevin Spacey's really cool, uh, <laughs> and and Robin Wright. But anyway, I I um I think that that. What, the reason these are such interesting programs right. is things are in flux. I do want to go to this gentleman here. I hope you're a millennial uh, right here. Yes. Uh, thank you. And I mean, this gentleman here in the blue sweater. I, I think that's right. And we'll try to hit a baby. This gentleman after him, we'll go back. Yes, sir. Okay, this is really cool. Just use um, your lungs. Okay. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Oscar Lee. I'm a Bezos scholar from New Jersey. And so my, con uh, my question is about content, like Ms. Kerger said before. 
And in my opinion, I feel like uh, network television right now is, looks pretty transgressive in terms of NBC upfronts. I feel like they're going for more of a CBS feel. And I feel like in terms of the last big hits on network television were pretty groundbreaking, um, weird, not traditional television like Lost, like De Desperate Housewives. And when I look for a television that comes from news perspectives, like queer perspectives, I'm not going to watch the new normal or modern families, not so modern families. I'm going to watch the out um, mm -hmm. online, the web series. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, why is network television going transgressive in its programming? And why do we see so many cop shows? And we see so many television shows, but why isn't there this movement towards news perspectives on network television? Any thoughts? Well, with network television in prime time, you have real issues, right? I mean, they can no longer aggregate the large audience that they used to aggregate, and they're competing against Showtime and HBO and A&E, which can have significantly more creative freedom, also have the ability to fund those programs because they're getting subscriber fees as opposed to just selling advertising. So I do think you're correctly pointing out that the, there's a little bit right now of, uh, of, an ex, uh, of a lost lost, uh, no, no pun intended, <laughs> but the, net, the networks are a little bit lost relative to what to do to compete with all this video and content. And they do also have an old model where you go do a pilot. Um, anyway, I, I, I don't know, I have much more to offer on that. Paula, uh, you run some series. Yeah, um, I, I think, uh, how do I answer this? I, I think as I look at uh, television right now, um, I think we actually are in a great era of, of scripted drama, and it's, that's largely on cable. Um, we have uh, Masterpiece, which is our contribution to the drama category, uh, but I think that, um, you know, I think that I agree with I agree with you. I think mm -hmm. the, the greatest innovation right now is coming out of cable, and I think part of it is because of the freedom that they have to invest deeply and, uh, and develop out talent and storylines that, frankly, you can't run on commercial yeah. television. Yeah. I would tell you, you know, for those of you to go back and look at, at, at content online, just to basically you know, be interactive, Richard Plepler, uh, who's the CEO of HBO, gave a great talk around the time of the White House Correspondent. It's online, I think it's under Time Magazine and Microsoft. Yeah. It was not an Atlantic event, unfortunately, but he really answered quite beautifully your, your question, sort of look at how HBO was navigating this, but also commenting on this sort of broader network. So uh, a resource for all of you to come into. Yes, Caesar? I would only add one more thing. Yeah. Um, I, I think we are going to start entering a place where a lot of the experimentation that's going on in the digital and online arena uh, content that you can't see on the on the traditional networks, um, we're going to begin to see sort of this counter um, population. In other words, we're going to see uh, things that are incubated in the digital world start making their way uh, to to some of the bigger bigger screen. Which I great. Wait, I, I've got to hold it there because we got three minutes. I'm going to take this gentleman and this gentleman in order, and then we'll have a quick lightning round and wrap up. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Brian McIver. Uh, Steve, I was in your last session, which was a fabulous session on the social media, and it was remarkably well mo moderated. Thank you. Um, but the view in that session was strikingly different than the view I'm getting from this panel. Um, this represents more a traditional view of media and the social media, the new wave media uh, and technology seem to be periphery at this point in time. And it's understandable given the success of your core businesses. But in the last session, the major thrust was about interactiveness, selectivity, um, and I'll pose this to ESPN. Sports news. Uh -huh. If I want to know what's going on in Wimbledon, mm -hmm. I've got to wait to go through football, basketball, mm -hmm. other sports to finally get to what's on in tennis uh -huh. today, as opposed to being able to say, I want all the news and what's going on at Wimbledon today on my smartphone. So how do you get to the selectivity well, we that have that. We wants? just have to help you discover it. Uh, we have that. Let me grab I mean, this you gentleman can... right back here just real quick and then, uh, so we can be true to everybody and then we'll get you all on board. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chris Wyatt. Not from you too. I've got a question for uh, all the panelists, actually. How do you see social television, specifically the interactivity of the viewers using text and video, what role is that going to play in your networks moving forward? And at the same time, how is gamif gamification going to affect your programming as well? Terrific. So we'll, we'll find up there and ask everybody to kind of um, also give any kind of final wrap-up comments. And I think that uh, to this gentleman's comment about the last session where we basically were looking at the perspective of 
news, entertainment, the choices you make in communications to the perspective of the person sitting in your chair, as opposed to where the broadcast is. I think Paula was talking about this with children and the interactivity, but, but how do you see both the question of social uh, media and then this broad question, you can talk about specifically about Wimbledon, but, but about who's in the driver's seat in this interactivity, that, that part of the question is the empowerment of the person watching is also a broadcaster, also a chooser. How do, how do big network chiefs deal with that? Sure, I'll, I'll comment real quickly from, um, from our perspective. Uh, when we look at certain genres of programming, we believe uh, that clearly social media, social interactivity is not only intricate to what we're doing, it's, it's the future of how we're consuming. So we're, uh, our viewers are consuming. We're leaning into it because to give you an example, we have a genre on, in, in Hispanic media called uh, telenovelas. They're like soap operas, but they're our prime time. This is a force of nature. This is what drives big prime time ratings. That viewer is very, um, very engaged in that content. And so if we are able to offer second screen experiences, encourage them to be able to interacting with other people as they're watching the main core program, um, that's going to keep them coming back night after night. And so we believe uh, that, that, that social media experience drives engagement, which is, is core to our success. Thank you. John? Uh, quickly, I can get you whatever's going on in Wimbledon in 30 seconds, I promise you. Uh, second, we, uh, social is complementary to sports. There's very little more social than sports. And our intention is to use the social media to sort of complement what we do. We don't have much intention to turn it over uh, to other folks. We intend to curate it. You just have to. And uh, I mean, and again, look at scale. We had 28 million people uh, watch the uh, seventh game of the NBA. I mean, it has to be peripheral. While everybody's excited about it, we had 250,000 tweets or so. Uh, that is fairly peripheral to 28 million. Mm. We, we use heavy, um, we're, we're heavy users of social media. In fact, I think part of the success of Downton Abbey actually is all tied to social media. It was a popular show that started, and it was when people began talking about it in the social media sphere that it exploded. People created Twitter identities based on character names. Lady Mary's eyebrows is my favorite. But um, I think that it cre we've always tried to provoke conversation, so I think it's been a, a really important space for that. Some of the work that we're building in digital is very much built with interactivity. So some of the, of the people that we've gone after that have been YouTube um, artists that are now working with us, the inter interactivity is definitely baked into the work that they're doing, so it's a seamless whole. So I think for us, it, that kind of interactivity has always been part of who we are. We've tried to fa facilitate community conversations. To be able to use technology is extraordinarily powerful. I think for me, one of the takeaways before we close, both in the last session, which had some very interesting collisions, and this one, is you see the world is not static. I understand what you just shared, but there is real evolution going on, and there's change, and there's a dynamic that's forcing uh, what you know, whether it's basically what your business model is and your concerns about the networks and you know, basically what these little platforms are going to drive. And I, I worry about what the next, next, next thing is going to be. Not worry about it. I'm excited about it. I want to embrace it. And you know, as somebody in the media, you know, I was just, as I said in the last thing, as a blogger who came in, I wanted to rip the throat out of inefficient, homogenized, lazy journalism uh, and, and, and drive it into something different. So I do think, I, I want to thank Paula Kerger, John Skipper, and Cesar Conde for a wonderful uh, insight into how network chiefs see this question. Thank all of you for joining us. Thank you.